Hallelujah. Lord, we love you so much. We love you so much, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are the word, Jesus. And you have given us the word in written form that we may study, that we may learn. We are so blessed, so blessed. Thank you, Lord. And welcome to everybody to ABC. The teaching this morning is entitled Job's Gems. Now we know the word of God is powerful. We know it's wonderful. It is our guide. It is our manual for living. Everything we need is in the Word of God, in those 66 books of the Old and the New Testament. It's where we go. That, combined with the Holy Spirit who who lives in us and teaches us, we pair the two together for the two always agree with each other. And so we look powerfully to the Word of God, every one of us, every day. The Word of God is foundational to our lives. The Word of God is last word of any question we may have. And the answer to every question, the solution to every problem is the Word of God. And I want to look first at the power of the Word of God and what the Word of God has to say about the Word of God, because it has some very wonderful things to say. And let's just take a look right now, starting with Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And if it's settled in heaven, then it's available to us here on the earth forever. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Psalm 119, 105. We saw this in one of the songs that we used for praise and worship. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we know if we don't have light, we stumble. We can't see where we're going. We, we're very uncertain in our steps. But when there's light, and the light is the light of, wor- of the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so we look to his word. He is the word of God. He's the light of the world. We have the written world with the light of God shining on it to lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Unless you think the simple means someone who's dumb or stupid or, you know, simple-minded. We tend to think of that a correlation. But I think what God is meaning here is one who is childlike, one who is humble, one who is open to receiving from God that the word will lead and guide us. In fact, Psalm 119, 133 says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Mm -mm. So here it's clear that if we focus on the word of God, if we allow our steps to be ordered by the word of God, then iniquity has no part with us. Praise God. That's very exciting. And we all know Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick. And here quick means living, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow. That's pretty amazing. We think sometimes we're being so private and so quiet, but mm -mm, the Holy Spirit knows. God knows all things. And he gave us his word to help us follow in his footsteps. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture, and I want to emphasize all scripture, Scripture, not just some of it, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God every day. We need to focus on it, to study it, to learn it, to apply it, to be hearers of the Word and doers also. And one last focus I want to make on the Word of God is in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter is established. And this is very important. And what's interesting is there are so many scriptures that talk about this. The key one I would like to use is Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Two or three make it so. And it brings up this again in Deuteronomy 17, 6 and Numbers 35, 30, where it's talking about a decision about putting somebody to death and they need at least two witnesses to verify that this is a just punishment. Three is good, but two is acceptable. One is not. We want two witnesses or three. And you know, the Word of God is so amazing. Throughout these 66 books in what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, written by many different people, penned by, written by the Holy Spirit, really, but penned by many different people throughout many different times. And you think, wow, isn't it amazing when you can get two verses from two totally different areas to say exactly the same thing? But that's our God. He orchestrated the whole thing that we call the Word of God, our Bible. And we find many repetitions, many two witnesses, many three witnesses, for God wants to get his point across, and he wants us to understand what he's saying to us. He wants us to know how important it is. And so we thank him for his word. And, you know, I'll bet we all have our favorite books of the Bible. Am I right? And I'll bet Psalms is one of them. I hear a lot of people quoting Psalms. And so, you know, that must be one they turn to a lot. And for some, it might be the Gospels or Ephesians. But then, <laughs> as Apostle Joshua spoke in the introduction, there are those books that mm -hmm, we get our way through it. If we're reading the whole Bible, they're there for us to read. But we kind of hurry through them because we don't really understand or we don't think they're very fun. Leviticus. You mentioned Leviticus. Leviticus are rules and regulations and, and processes and steps to follow and details, details, heavy stuff, stuff, stuff. Whoa. Okay, so Leviticus might not be a favorite one. And Ecclesiastes, that's kind of a heavy-duty one. It's... Um, a time to this and a time to that and nothing new under the sun and oh well, oh well, you know. <laughs> so Ecclesiastes might not be such a great one either. Numbers, for those that aren't math specialists, they just see this as a blur of a bunch of numbers and what do we do with that? And then there's Job. And I'm not a betting person, but I might almost be willing to bet that everybody's least favorite book is Job. They say it's the oldest book of the Bible, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. It's a long book, and a lot of discussion, a lot of things come up, and, and there's a lot we really still don't understand. But over the last year and some months, I have been going through the Bible listening to it on tape. And each tape I go through at least four times. 
a few of them I've even gone through five times because I want to listen over and over. I want to hear. I don't want to miss things. And sometimes I'll catch something on one, and the next time through, I catch the context of it, and I learn more about it. Now, obviously, I'm not going to learn everything there is to learn yet. This is an ongoing, lifelong process. But I have learned so much going through these tapes four times over. And I came to Job, and I was amazingly surprised to find, oh, that's a really neat verse. Oh, well, that's really cool. <laughs> Realizing I call them gems because there's some verses that are very special or that are very precious that really stand out to me, and I think you'll find they will to you too. I've chosen some of them to highlight today, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you will find at least one other scripture somewhere else in the Bible that aligns with what Job has to say. And so let's explore the gems of Job. Number one is probably the most famous scripture, most famous verse in this book. And this is Job 3.25. Job says, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. How many times have we heard this one verse highlighted in the book of Job? Fear. Job was in such fear that he would sacrifice every single day on behalf of his children because he was so afraid of what might happen to them. He was so afraid of negative things coming to pass. And so his faith action plan, if you will, lined up with the fear. And guess what? We know, because we've read the book of Job, we know what happens to his children. And it's not good. So the subject here is fear. 1 John 4.18 talks about fear. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Was Job tormented? Absolutely. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Wow, that's pretty heavy. But here's the key. We need love. And love can do something about the fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 is a verse I believe we all know. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound, well-disciplined mind. Because... When someone is in fear, they're not in love, they're discombobulated, they're all over the place, and they're just weak. They're tormented in fear. But that doesn't come from God. That fear comes from the devil. Love comes from God. How many times did Jesus say, fear not? Over and over again, we hear him say, Fear not, only believe. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Jesus is trying to tell them, you don't need to be in fear. You don't want to be in fear. Fear is of the devil, and you are of me, so you are of love, not fear. And I see it like this, that faith is trust in God. Fear is trust in the devil. You might want to say that fear is faith in the devil because we're trusting in the power of the devil to do terrible things when we are in fear. It's the what if. But we have some good things to look forward to. And number two verse is from Job 4, 8, sowing and reaping. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Sow and reap. 
the world has a saying, what goes around comes around, saying the same thing. They don't realize it's scripture, but it really is. And Galatians 6, 7 speaks it very clearly. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What you sow is a seed that has to come to fruition. You know, it's impossible to plant corn seeds and have a harvest of wheat. Doesn't work. Doesn't work that way. The seed that you sow is what the harvest will be when it comes to fruition. So whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Pay attention to the words we say, to the expectations that we have, to the things that we do, and expect that we line up with the word of God to say the good things so that we reap the good things. Okay, now we saw the word of God is good for correction as well. And here Job talks about the chastening of the Lord in chapter 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God chasteneth and correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Whoa, okay. But you know, this is in other verses. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son, in whom he delighteth. And there's the key. We as children make mistakes. God needs to look over us as a father. And it's because he loves us because he cares about us, because he wants us to line up with his ways, that he chastens and corrects us. And instead of being, I don't want to hear it, that's not the attitude we need to take. We need to say, okay, Lord, where did I blow it? And then we ask him to forgive us, and then we go on with saying, okay, I'm going to correct this. I'm going to do this the right way. We need to learn when he chastens and corrects us, that's the last time I do that. I'm going to do it God's way from now on because of his love. And you know, it even talks about this in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son... Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God loves us. He receives us. He envelops us in his presence. And that's why we need an occasional tweaking, occasional chastising changing the way we do things to line up with the word of God. What a wonderful opportunity for us. And in the process, one of the things that we can pay attention to is Job 6.25. How forcible or how forceful are right words. Right words. Not just words, but right words. We know from Proverbs 18.21 that Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that loveth shall eat the fruit thereof. What fruit is that? Well, for those that speak death, they get the fruit of death. For those that speak life, they get the fruit of life. And whatever you sow, you shall reap. Words are seeds. What we say, we shall have. So, we want to pay strict attention, and learn from this. God cares about us so much. He loves us so much. And he's telling us in no uncertain terms how we can live victoriously. So let's pay attention. Job 7.17. Well, after the chastening, this might 
come up as a question. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him and that thou should set thine heart upon him? What is man? Looking at man compared to God. God is so almighty. He's so awesome. He's so wonderful. And what is the little old man? You think he's thinking grasshopper style? Sounds like that to me. But you know what? Job isn't the only one where this question was raised. Psalm 8, 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Well, we know in the Psalms there's a lot of emotion expended about, okay, things aren't going so well, Lord help. (laughs) And you get some of that, well, you know, who am I compared to you, God? What is man? And then Psalm 144, verse 3, same thing again. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? But we already know it's because God loves us. God created us in his likeness, in his image. He wants us to think and speak and act exactly like he does. Exactly as he does. That's the goal. We want to be just like our daddy God, our Abba Daddy. And so he pays attention, and he chastises us, he loves us, and he's letting us know, no, you're not just a man. You're my creation. I made you in my image. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. I love you. This is who we are. So sometimes on an off day, we might go, oh, what is man? But then we remember, I'm a child of the living God, bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. I am special. I am the apple of God's eye. (sighs) We can just bask in that. And that should lead to laughing and rejoicing. Job chapter 8, verse 21. Till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing because we're God's kids, because God loves us, because God is so good to us. Wow. I was reminded of Isaiah 61, 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Wow. Joy, joy, joy. God wants us to know joy. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit that when we receive Jesus comes into our spirit, man. And the Lord is the joy of our life, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy singing, praising, rejoicing. Wonderful. You realize the word rejoice basically is saying we're joining again over and over again. Rejoice, rejoice, (laughs) rejoice. So we want to keep that foremost. Think joy, think rejoicing, think joy. Keep a smile on your face. Let that joy come out. Let the world see the joy that you have in Jesus just exude, that you're always kind to people, you're always gentle, you're always encouraging. That's the joy of the Lord. And we know that God made us and fashioned us. Job 10.8 says, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about. And how could we not go to Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Wow, that's our God. He knew us from the beginning. He knew us before we were even created. He knew we were coming, 
and he knows the number of hairs on our head. That's the kind of detail that he knows about us. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart because he cares about us, because he's leading us and guiding us in his way. The next scripture is from Job 11, verse 19. Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. I'm really focusing on this with three witnesses that line up with this scripture, because I know a lot of people have challenges going to sleep. And so this is something we can keep in mind. We as ABCers know how to take the word of God and turn it into an affirmation, personalize it for our situation, to be able to turn it around and say, okay, this is what God is doing for me. And if you are one of those that is having a challenge going to sleep at night on, let's say, a regular basis, then you want to create this affirmation. And you want to do it frequently throughout the day. Don't wait till you go to bed to start doing it. You need, when you go to bed, to lie your head down and go to sleep. So as you're emphasizing this through the Word of God throughout the day, then you're prepared for when you go to bed. And maybe it won't be the first night, but persist For the word of God is always true, and you are always victorious. I like to say the word of God works for you when you work the word of God. So let's look at these other scriptures. Remember Job 11, 19 says, Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Psalm 4, 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Proverbs 3, 24. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, Thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. So that not only means that you're able to go to sleep, you sleep soundly, you sleep sweetly, and there are no bad dreams, no nightmares, nothing disturbing your sleep. A lot of times I like to say, and my Abba Daddy gives his beloved Sarah deep, sweet, Amen. Moving on to Job 14.7. Hope for a tree. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. They think, well, this seems a little whimsical. What's the deal with the tree? But think about God as creator. A tree that's cut down but the scripture is saying, still has life in it. I can attest to that. We had a very large tree in our backyard. Beautiful tree. was there for years. And then it got a disease on it, and we had to cut it down. Do you know that tree still keeps sending forth shoots, leaves, branches? Because we didn't cut the roots. We cut it down to the ground, but the roots are still alive and still sending that up. And you know, you see, whenever there's evidence of a forest fire and trees are burned down to the ground, but the roots are still there under the soil. And what do you see? The next spring, all this green, all this new life coming up. All these things that got burned down, the trees, the bushes, the flowers, but they're coming back. There's new life because of our God, because of how he created them. So even a tree, there is hope for. And we speak of God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. 
And there are various scriptures that talk about it, but Job is very strong on the things God did in creating the heavens and the earth. All of Job 26 and all of Job 38, you might want to take a look at and read through. I will highlight only some of those verses to isolate certain points. I'm going to do Job 26, verses 7 through 13a. In other words, the first part of 13. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. (laughs) We look at this and we say, earth is not hanging on anything. It's hanging on nothing. God, how did you do that? But he's God, and that's what he did. Here we are. Earth is out in space. And it appears to be hanging on nothing. It does have an axis. But what is that axis connected to? Hmm. Moving on, he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds. In setting up the layout of the earth, of the land, and the seas, he compassed the waters with bounds. In other words, it has its limitations. Until the day and night come to an end, the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. And to me, that means when you look out, especially if you're in an area away from a city, like in the middle of a desert or uh, even maybe out on the sea, and you look up at the sky and you see thousands of stars, that's garnishing the heavens. The heavens are so amazing. And our God is the creator of all of that. Wow. Job 38 verses 4 through 11. And this is God speaking to Job. Quote, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations therefore fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it brake forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and brake up for my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no farther. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. God laid it all out. And he knew about low tide and high tide. But the waves, he said, could go just so far on his creation. Job 27, verse 17. This is talking about one shall labor and another reap benefits which for those of us in these last days, we need to pay attention. We need to be in expectation that we'll be on the receiving end of this. He may prepare it, but the just shall put it on. Hello, the just. And the innocent shall divide the silver. Wow, that sounds like God's preparation and provision, right? Deuteronomy 28, 30 to 33, I was reminded of with the scripture. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. 
Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and then I shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed away. Okay, now the essence here is that there are those who are preparing in this manner. They're building up their houses, their lands, their herds, their flocks, and they think, like the man in the Gospels, ah, oh, okay, everything's fine, and you know what? My barns are kind of small. I think I'm going to tear them down, and, and just I've got lots of fruits and lots of things to last me the rest of my life. going to build new ones and fill them up and then eat, drink, and be merry. And God's saying, mm-mm, that man had to give account of his life that very night. And so somebody else got the benefit of whatever he had. We, as God's kids, he's looking out for us. He's watching over us. We need to be alert and aware when an opportunity arises that we can receive something that somebody else has labored for and we receive the benefits thereof. One of the things that's especially unique to these last days. In Job 28, verses 12 through 19, and again verse 28, we talk about wisdom and understanding. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, Neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it's not in me. And the sea saith, it's not in me. It cannot be gotten for gold. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. Rubies are beautiful and they're valuable, but God says wisdom is better, far better than rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. In verse 28, unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. This is following the word of God. And this verse about the value being above rubies, haven't we heard that before? How about Proverbs 3, verse 15? She, meaning wisdom, is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto wisdom. Proverbs verse, chapter 8, verse 11. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that thou, thou may be desired are not to be compared to it. Wow, sounds like just the same thing here. Wisdom. Awesome. And then we talked about the fear of the Lord. And so let's look at Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So here we're talking about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And they all come through God. And they're worth far more than any physical things, material things that we could possibly have. All the riches of the world are not worth what these are. So as we have God's wisdom and God's knowledge and God's understanding, we are very, very wealthy in the things of God. And 
you may remember a teaching I did on November 27, 2022, entitled Bejeweled. I was talking about how God looks at jewels and mentions them throughout the Bible. There are various references. And in fact, these are two really outstanding ones. The priest ephod had 12 jewels on it, and they were pretty good sized from what I've seen of pictures. And what about the foundations of New Jerusalem? That's where we're headed in the future. That's our goal. That's our direction. And the 12 foundations are pure gems and jewels. Wow. God is so amazing, and he gives us such beauty. But he says that his wisdom is better than that. But you know what? It's his wisdom and his knowledge and his understanding that will get us to the new Jerusalem when we put that into practice in our lives. And so then we can enjoy the beauty of those marvelous foundations. Number 13, prosperity and pleasure. Job 36, 11. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Wow, that sounds good, right? Well, and then what does it say in Isaiah 119? If ye be willing and obedient, sound familiar? Ye shall eat the good of the land. Wow, doing things God's way, he provides richly for us. Psalm 35, 27, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And if his servant, how much more his children. Amen. And that leads into Job thirty-six sixteen. A broad place and richness. Even so, would he have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. In other words, rich provision God has for us. And we go the narrow path to go to him, but as we do, then he's able to broaden our path into the fullness of all the wonderful things that he has for us. And this expression of broad place or large place occurs several times throughout the book of Psalms. Psalm eighteen nineteen, he brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. There's that love and the joy that the Father has for us, his children. Psalm 31, 8. And hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy? Thou hast set my feet in a large room. Psalm 118, verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. In Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Wow, God's provision is more than enough. Psalm 3, 8, Salvation belongeth to the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Job 8, 7 talks about Small beginnings leading to increased abundance. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Job 42, verses 10 and 12, talk about how this was true for Job. He was restored double what he had in the beginning. His latter days were more blessed than his beginning days. Starting with verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. 
He was walking in love and forgiveness toward his friends. He loved them. He forgave them. He prayed for them. And then the Lord could release and give Job twice as much as he had before. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-asses, and he had twice as many children as well. Very, very prosperous. And another verse that lines up with this is Zechariah 4.10, For who hath despised the day of small things? It's a beginning. It leads to bigger and greater things. Job 22.28, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. What scripture does this bring to your mind? To my mind was Mark 11, 23 and 24. ABCers, have we heard these verses before? A few hundred or thousand times maybe? And I've capsulated it to say four words. Say, believe, pray, receive. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark eleven twenty three twenty four, say, believe, pray, receive. And I'm ending with Job 22, verses 21 through 28. I've chosen to print this out for everybody with your outline so that you will have this ongoing. To me, it's words of blessing, words of encouragement, it's really a prayer, and then as I mentioned earlier, we ABCers know how to personalize and make prayers out of the Word of God, speaking them over ourselves. And so I thought this one was worthy of that. Job 22, verses 21 through 28. Acquaint now thyself with him, with God, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, in other words, the word of God, and lay up his words in thine heart. Memorize them, speak them, live them. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. It's encouraging us to focus so much on the Word of God, letting that Word be alive in us, that iniquity can have no place in us when the Word of God is preeminent. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust. Ooh, sounds like financial provision as well. And the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense protection, and thou shalt have plenty of silver, provision. For then thou shalt have thy delight in the Almighty, and shall lift up thy face unto God. Then shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy way. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastora Sarah, for those 
gems from Job. And it is amazing how the word does back itself up. It does repeat itself because it's truth. And the word of God is truth. And we would think from the book of Job, but yes, even from the book of Job. And <laughs> so I do have a much better appreciation now of that book. Thank you very much. Well, the word of God is light. It does illumine us. It does bring to our understanding the truth of God's word. So we want to take this time now and we'll go into communion. We're so very thankful, Heavenly Father, that you have given us a covenant through your Son that he is the door, he is the way. And Jesus, he said that this is your body broken for us, to eat this in remembrance of you, that with your body being crushed and bruised and broken, that we have a way to the Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the bread of life, in you is eternal life. And eternal life is to know you. That you are God so very near, so present, so available, so loving and kind, that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself. And as we eat of this, the bread of life, the body of our Lord Jesus, that you have given us health, that by the stripes of Jesus we have been healed, that all infirmities, sicknesses, diseases, and pains, all suffering is done away with because Jesus, you bore it in your body. So as we eat of this, the bread of life, you said that healing is the children's bread. And so we eat of this bread in Jesus' name. Thank you. And on that night, you also took the cup, Lord, and you said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Jesus, you took your blood and you put it on the mercy seat. And when the Father sees that blood, he knows the sacrifice. He knows the love that went into it that the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It is great love, love unsurpassed, love eternal, that there's nothing that, can make, that we can do that could make God love us more, and there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. It is love. Jesus that kept you on that cross because you knew that we would also then become children of God. Now we are the children of God, but it is not yet apparent what we shall be. For when you appear, Lord Jesus, we shall be like you. We are moving closer and closer to the image of Christ. Because that is the end goal for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are moving in us. You're producing life in us. You're producing the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts that you've given. To where the world would not even be able to discern. 
between us and Jesus. For we shall be like him in this world. There is a place, Jesus, you are above all. And we're coming after. You are the first fruits of many sons and daughters. And we receive this cup, this cup of blessing. Thank you for this blessing to be like you. In Jesus' name. So let's say together, we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus ten times. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus.